Hi, I just want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the history of certain art cinema that informed a lot of American Hollywood films. And I want to go and talk about uh, German Expressionism as an art form and how it informed German cinema, because that then trickled over to America and cr helped create a genre that we call film noir. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Expressionism is really, it's a modernist movement. Um, it's found greatly in art and in poetry. Um, it really is from the beginning of the 20th century, some late 1800s, but really early 1900s. Um, and it's a, it's a subjective perspective. The, the artist individually, we don't get large sweeping um, kind of fly on the wall type of perspectives, but like the, um, the experience of the artist is integral to the physical reality that we see um, in a visual medium. So here's the screen by Edvard Munch, um, late 1800s. Um, we've got large blue horse, Franz Marc. Um, you can see the uh, modernism kind of coming in here and um, the reality of, of the photoreality of the painting has gone away. We have photography at this point. You can capture what the world actually looks like with a photograph faster than you can with a paintbrush. And so artists have found other ways of using their art and having the reality of their experience in the world inform their art, not necessarily what the world looks like objectively. So expressionism crept into dance. Whoop, that was went by fast, but that's okay. Um, literature, Franz Kafka, maybe you've read The Metamorphosis, where uh, Gregor Mendel wakes up one morning as a cockroach. Um, and eventually, of course, we get to cinema. Now, we, we watched the French film La Jetée. That's from the 50s. We're going to go back a little bit earlier than that. But one big difference between American cinema and the development of cinema in other countries, Germany, Russia, France, um, most of these other countries treated cinema as another art form like photography, like painting, like dance, um, like literature. And in America, it was really about the narrative. Really, it's about storytelling. How can we tell stories um, on film? Not and uh, and the visual element, the interpretive element, the emotional element was not as important to the Americans as it was to uh, in other countries. Um, that crept in over time. And in Germany in the twenties, um, it's really the expressionism. Um, of their art really crept into the art of cinema. And you get films like Nosferatu, a vampire story. It's really Dracula, um, but didn't have the rights to Dracula. And you can just see from some of these images um, that shadows play a huge, important um, role in these. Visually, they're uh, interesting. They're fun to light um, as a cinematographer. And they can be symbolic and metaphoric, what's happening in the shadow. It's not. It's almost a reflection of the human. It's not quite the human. Um, and the um, cinema that came out of this era in Germany was uh, dark and brooding and interpretive. So you get uh, visual elements. They shot at night. Well, Americans were shooting day for night for a, for a long time. I um, mean, you just kind of um, shoot your scene that's supposed to take place at night and then um, dye it or darken it in post-production. And the lighting doesn't quite look like night, but it's dark, so it passes for night. Um, the shadows and the dark and the deep, rich blacks in German Expressionist cinema were very important, so they used high-key lighting and not a lot of fill. There would be rich blacks. Um, you wouldn't be able to see everything that was happening on the screen at the same time. Some of the, the sets were not necessarily realistic. They were uh, meant to give more of an impression or an expression because it's Expressionist cinema. Uh, here's a shot from, from M, the emotions that came out through the shadows and the light. And I showed you those stills from German Expressionism to let you know what was happening in cinema across the ocean um, in the 20s and 30s. Now, everything is shared. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes ideas take a little while to become shared, um, especially in this time period. But eventually, the um, German filmmakers, the German films made their way to Hollywood, and uh, some of the studios really got a... Uh, um, were enamored of some of these films. And this whole genre of American films started coming up and using the darks, the, the, the gritty shadows, um, more than, uh, than they had been before. Um, and it really harkens back to German Expressionism. This genre that emerges is called film noir. And, uh, you know, it's French because most, um, uh, most the word cinema and most uh, terms uh, that we have for movie making comes from the French. Film noir meaning black film, black cinema. 
and it really just talking about the shadows and the light um, and some of the darker themes that emerged. Now, in Hollywood, the stories, which were so important, um, often had lots of twists, but the stories that went along with film noir were often that of the darker side of humanity and um, detectives, private detectives. Now, we know from German Expressionism that the shadows and light are important, but we also know that the themes of a lot of these films are madness, insanity, betrayal, the heavier, darker uh, emotions of humankind are also on display, and that's um, that's elaborated through the visuals. So as we get into film noir um, in Hollywood, uh, the the violence kind of takes place the place of these uh, darker brooding themes um, intensity of romance and then um, uh, themes of maybe feeling entrapped by society corrupt society these sort of large looming darknesses um, that are you know maybe our our political systems aren't working the way that they're supposed to or maybe the um, businessman who's smiling um, has a dark shady past and an underbelly. Um, these kind of spiritual corruption themes are, are at play in film noir. So here is a sample of a film noir uh, genre from a commercial that you probably have seen. Is it playing? Where is it? She was she beauty, was beauty brain, brain, and damp. You have to help me. I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt, and I need cash. You have that insurance, don't you, sweetheart? What insurance? There's the rub. I couldn't remember. When it pays you the dough when you're hurt and miss work. Go ask about whatever it's called. <laughs> ask about what? So that was, you know, a silly little commercial, but it's riffing on the themes and the tropes of film noir. You've probably seen this style parodied, lampooned, or referred to in culture. I mean, I know that some video games take the look of the detective with the Venetian blinds. The Venetian blinds are amazing because you can put a light behind them and cast them into the room, and then you have shadows and light happening at the same time, these bars, these places that are uh, on the screen that are hidden and uh, that you can see at the same time. Uh, so that that's became almost a cliche of the era. Black and white, the private detective, the voiceover. There she was. She came into my office. She had legs up to her eyelashes. Or, you know, that, that private detective, pa detective patter. Um, private detectives are often a, a used um, character because they uniquely walk the boundaries of society. They're partially lawmen, but they're not police. And they um, are able to to fraternize with criminal elements because they're not police. And you're never sure if the private investigator is a good person or a bad person. Here's another sample from culture that riffs on the same uh, tropes and cliches from film noir. Sesame Street. <laughs> My name's, my name's Dave. Dave. Detective, Detective Dave. Dave. I was dining, I was dining on a dining delightful on a Danish, Danish at my, at my desk, desk when I discovered, I discovered a dubious, dubious drumming, drumming on the door. On the door. It, was it was Darlene, Darlene. A, dynamite a dynamite dancer, dancer with a dilemma. dilemma. Detective Dave, do something. There's something drastically wrong with my dog. Your dog's so in danger. So even Darlene. Sesame Street uses the uh, the cliches that we're so familiar with. The um, the '40s era. Dame, I guess you call her. I'm not comfortable with that word myself, but that's what that's the word that would be used in that time. Uh, comes in seeking help from the private investigator. Um, she turns out to be perhaps a uh, a vamp, a uh, uh, vixen, somebody who maybe has uh, evil intent, but we don't know that. She just kind of seems vulnerable at first. Um, we've got visually th thematic. Uh, th thematically, visually, and psychologically dark themes. Um, I'm going to show you some stills from the film that we're about to watch, the one that I'm setting up. It's called The Maltese Falcon from 1941. Um, and that sort of epitomized the, it's kind of the first of the film noir genre, detective genre um, in Hollywood. Um, now, Hollywood often used an urban setting cities. Cities have alleys with dark corners. Um, cities have street lights so that they can cast sharp light at night um, and then contrasting against the shadows. 
Cities are places with moral ambiguity. There are um, elements of good and evil. Um, there are places to hide in cities. There's an, an, an anonymity in cities. Um, and a lot of times the framing will give you this sort of trapped feel. You see how Humphrey Bogart, the detective in the middle there, is kind of uh, framed by the two other police investigators in the shot. You often get the femme fatale or vamp, the, the damsel in distress, at, um, so it seems at the beginning, but then she turns into um, perhaps a, uh, a character to be reckoned with, maybe, maybe not the, uh, the innocent heroine that we thought at the beginning. Uh, a lot of detective stories were being written um, at the time, and the hard-boiled detective uh, made very good crime stories, um, Hollywood being so plot-driven. These detective stories became very good fodder for film noir, uh, particularly, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now, I think I have it on another slide, um, Dashiell, Dashiell, oh, I can't remember his name, Dashiell Hemet um, was a, a famous author at the time who whose uh, books became many detective movies. The lack of moral clarity, I think, is really clear. Um, it's The lack of clarity is clear. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's very evident in a lot of these film noirs, particularly the Maltese Falcon, which we're about to watch. Our main character, um, Sam Spade, this is him on the stairs um, in the shadows. Uh, our main character is a private detective, and we wonder about him f through the whole film. He is he takes a job. Um, bad things happen around him, and we wonder the extent to which he's involved, the extent to which he's bothered by bad things or evil in society, the extent to which he's a good guy. Um, we we are wondering about that. There's an ambiguity about him um, that is just not clear until the end of the movie, um, where his characterization is made very clear um, in the resolution of the plot. Um, shadows become characters, right? Like shadows are very important. I think I've said that like seven times. Um, and shooting night for night, um, as I mentioned earlier. So we're just about there. We're going to watch the Maltese Falcon. Um, look for all the elements of film noir that you might know as sort of generic tropes as we look back on them. The, the private investigator with the fedora, the vamp um, who needs help, the shadows and light, the office with Venetian blinds, light coming in, perhaps um, silhouettes or shadows on the floors, um, and a moral ambiguity. But since this is Hollywood, also complicated plots. What I really like about this film is uh, is the patter, okay, which is just kind of the word in the 50s for the banter, or in the 40s rather, for the banter, the dialogue. Um, Humphrey Bogart talk, talks very quickly. His character, Sam Spade, isn't that a great name? He's a detective. He digs up dirt he, like a spade. Sam Spade is um, uh, sharp-witted, sort of the smartest guy in the room every time. He's a tough guy, even though he's not. He's slight of figure. He's not kind of our modern um, heroic tough guy with um, you know giant shoulders and six-pack abs. He um, he's tough in a more urban way in a more understated way until he needs to be very masculine um, in that way. Um, will throw a punch or pull a gun um, as well as outwit somebody with his language. But listen to the language. It, it will probably take you a few minutes to kind of uh, acclimate to this to the uh, style of talking. It's 1941, okay? This is 80 years old. They don't talk the way that they talk in movies now, partially because it's of a different time period, and partially because filmmaking has become different. But it's very clever patter, and Sam Spade is a very clever wordsmith, and um, I guess it's the English teacher in me that really responds to the dialogue in these old films um, as being really fun, clever, and, uh, and even funny to listen to. So, um, 1941, uh, John Huston was became a very big Hollywood director after this film. This is actually a fairly low budget film, as were many film noirs. Um, film noirs, you know, you could you could hire people who weren't stars. Before this point, Humphrey Bogart was not a big star. He did become a big star after this movie, as did John Huston. But um, you could shoot these films for fairly low budget because you hadn't didn't have to construct locations. They were mostly shot on location in cities. This is one takes place, I believe, in San Francisco. Just real locations outside. Um, you didn't have A-list actors. You didn't need a lot of lighting. You used a lot of available lighting. You used a lot of night, dark skies. Um, and so these these were pretty cheap movies to make. Um, and so studios loved them that they became popular and started selling tickets. So with all of that in mind, keep this uh, 
Keep this film genre, film noir, in mind as we watch The Maltese Falcon. We will be watching one more film noir of this era um, after this, a film called Double Indemnity from three years later. Um, the only thing that we don't have in The Maltese Falcon that becomes a cliche of the film noir era is the the voiceover, the detective telling the story um, that we hear kind of in the audio. You don't get that in this film. The next film that we watch will be the from 1944 will be the first film that has that voiceover that then becomes the generic um, cliche of the film noir detective film. Anyway, hope you enjoy it. The Maltese Falcon from 1941.